Golly, that's good. I haven't found my first plant. <laughs> wow. That's different. I really like that. Peshods or Pechods or Pecha! <laughs> yeah, now I'm gorgeous. Although probably fuzzier was better. Okay. So this is not what I expected. <laughs> <laughs> And it's Thursday, and we came this close to having another audio incident. <laughs> I sat down, and I started to play around, and I realized that the microphone wasn't on again. Uh, so I had to fix a few settings and mess with some stuff, and I figured it out, and now we've got audio. And I don't have to be embarrassed, and I don't have to realize that I'm talking and talking and talking, and you're not hearing anything. <laughs> Yeah, but it does seem like it might be a little bit loud, so I'm going to turn it down just a smidge. There we go. That's a little better. Okay, so Lester's here, and Kevin is here, and I know Kevin does have a bottle of the pin hook. That's what we're going to be doing today. Uh, lots of information on pin hook. Kind of a fascinating story how they do things, and let's get into it uh, as I open this. Uh, first of all, before uh, we get too far, I found out today that uh, MGP, while they're not called MGP anymore, now they're called Ross and Squib. They have a new release of the Rossville Union. Now, I did Rossville Union last year, and I really liked it. And the thing about this one, it's aged seven years, and it's barrel-proof. So be on the lookout for Rossford Union, the barrel-proof rye from, um, from MGP slash uh, Ross and Squib. I think MGP is a better name myself. Speaking of MGP, let's talk about Pinhook. It is the juice. Uh, well, MGP used to do Pinhook juice up until about 2017. Hi, Mike. How are you? And then in 2017, they switched, and now Castle and Key is doing their juice. They do their stuff. And then it's blended by one of their guys, uh, one of the owners of the company, um... Beep, 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 beep. Sean Josephs, he's a certified wine sommelier. Uh, so that's going to be one of the reasons why this is kind of looked of looked after as a as a wine instead of a whiskey. Um, but um, let's see here. Uh, the Pinhook Bohemian Bourbon from 2020 was the first bourbon to be made at that facility, the OFC facility, which is now Castle and Key, since 1973 when OFC. Later, the old Taylor Distillery, which became Buffalo Trace, still in Frankfurt, but a different location. Um, they left the Castle and Key location that they built, and it was abandoned for decades until Castle and Key came in and started making their spirits there. And the Bohemian was the first one. That was a 2020 uh, uh, whiskey that came out. It was the first one since 1973 that came out of that particular distillery. So kind of cool stuff there. Good, sir. Cheers. Excited for this one. Yeah, me too. Uh, I have... I don't know how much, I don't know how long Pinhook has been in Ohio. I've only been seeing it recently. I happened to be at a Kroger's uh, the other day, and they had a Pinhook out on the shelf, but they also had a, a case of it back behind the register. Now, this was Tuesday. I was out doing my grocery shopping. <laughs> Got some asparagus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, I can still smell that today, too. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, and they, the girl that was there, she and I kind of know each other a little bit. I picked on her one time when she was smashing eggs on accident. And uh, she showed me that they had a case of the pin hook back behind the register. It was probably there. They probably weren't allowed to put it out until Wednesday, which is their release day. So it is what it is. But I have two of them here. There's more than this. They have several of these. We'll get into pin hook here. Tyler's watching. How are you, sir? Thank you for uh, tuning in. I, I appreciate it. We're going to let this sit for just a minute. we got the pin hook bourbon going. Uh, we're reading a little bit about it. Blended and proofed by uh, Sean Josephs. Um, they say three years, four months, and then it's bottled by Kentucky Artisan Distillery and shipped out. Okay, now. Here's some of the stuff that sets it apart. Uh, Pinhook treats their bourbons and rice like vintners treat their wines. And again, Sean Joseph is a sommelier, so that may have something to do with this. It's said to be the... they what, it, what they put in the bottle is said to be the best expression of what they have when they have it, which is the way the wine is done. They don't bottle it and hold on to it. They pick the best of what they've got, and they make it the 2020 vintage of that wine 
and if you buy it, then that's that's it. That you're not going to get it five years from now unless you find it at an auction somewhere and you pay way too much for it. You know, somebody may say, "Oh, the 2020 vintage wine, hmm, it really was great that year." Well, then you know, wait four or five years and it peaks, right? Bur bourbon doesn't do that. But they do choose the best expression of what's in the barrels at the time, and that's what they release. They release it one time, and that's it. Uh, they do it prior to the Kentucky Derby, and we'll get into that too. Um, but they do that, and then once this 22, 2022 bottle is gone, it's gone. They won't make any more of it because it only comes out once, okay? Um, once they're sold out, they're gone forever. Pinhook founded in 2010 by three friends who really didn't know what they were doing. Uh, again, the one guy knew wine, but they didn't know much about whiskey. Uh, pin hooking, by the way, refers to a practice of buying and raising a young horse based on a pedigree. A year or two after its purchase, the horse is sold for profit to a breeder or used for racing. Pinhook's founders view their approach to whiskey making similarly, sourcing barrels of unaged bourbon and selling the product once it has matured. Ooh. Ooh, me likey. <laughs> I know. I give you all this great information, then I turn into a kindergartner. Mmm, yum! <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. So, uh, the other thing about Pinhook that's interesting, of course, it's all about the horses, right? They have the horses right here on the label, and it has, each vintage is named after one of the horses on Bourbon Lane uh, stables, from Bourbon Lane stables. Every horse in Bourbon Lane has the name of either their name has got bourbon in it or rye, rye in it. So this one, this one is uh, Bourbon Dini. He is 16.1 hands in size. He is bay in color and he's a colt. Okay. So this one, the rye, which we will taste as well. This one is rye money. That's two words, rye money. He's 16 hands in size, chestnut, and this is a filly. All right, so we'll get into that a little bit more here in just a minute. Uh, let's see. Um, each vintage is dedicated to promising a young thoroughbred from that stable that they think has a chance at winning the Kentucky Derby. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay. Uh, breaking with a standard approach to American whiskeys, um, Pinhook sees each one of these as its own crop, just like wine. Okay. If that isn't enough information for you. <laughs> now, I couldn't get this to work. And maybe there wasn't enough light or whatever, but these are interactive bottles. If you've ever seen um, Nine Crimes or Seven Crimes, or I think it's Nine Crimes or something like that. It's a, it's a wine. And they have these gangsters on the bottle. And you use a phone app and you point your phone app at the bottle and the bottle will talk to you in sort of the character that's on it. Like there was a Snoop Dogg version. That's all I'm going to say about that one. So there's a QR code on the back of the bottle. That's where you go to get the app. And then you point the app at the label and it's supposed to be interactive. I couldn't get mine to work. Maybe not enough light. I don't know. Okay, so the bourbon is 75% corn, 15% rye, 10% malted barley. The 2021 vintage was 98 proof. This one is 100 proof, but it has the same mash bill as last year. All right, so let's uh, let's get into this. Right now, the first thing that hits me is cinnamon and honey. Honey is just pow, pow. And I like that, though. Don't get me wrong. I like that. Getting some clove. Some uh, pepper. Um, it has 15% rye. So, I may be getting some of those rye notes. What they say is that I should be uh, smelling baked peaches and orange blossom. I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> that pepper got me. Woo, baby. <laughs> Hopefully that's the only one, but normally it isn't. All right. That's what I get for sticking my nose down in the glass. Denny's watching. Hey, Denny. How are you? We were just chatting yesterday. He said he might join me if he had the time. Nice to see you, buddy. So uh, this is the uh, Pin Hook Bourbon. 20% corn. I'm sorry. 75% corn. 15% rye. 10% malted barley. Right now I'm getting uh, honey on the nose, some pepper, uh, some clove. And here we go.
Okay. Um, three years, four months. My first impression of this, when I first put it in my mouth, it's young. Um, it's that it could use some more time, I think, in the barrel. The hundred proof here drinks hotter than some of the stuff that I've been drinking that's overproofed. Um, the ethanol was not present to me on the nose, but it's the first thing I noticed on the palate. I just had a very youthful palate. Um, so, uh, let me, uh, now that I've gotten past the first one, let me see if I can give you some good tasting here. It's young. To me, it's young. Um, it's, it's tasty. It's not going to be one that I'm going to say, oh, you should buy this. Um, I like trying new things, and I like seeing what I think of it. To me, the, the, now, give this some time sitting on the shelf after I've opened it. It may mellow out. It may completely change in character, and that's what I'm guessing this one's going to do. It just gives me those characteristics. It tells me, let it sit, open it again later, and see. And we're going to put it on water here shortly, and I'm going to put that to the test. Um, but they say I should be tasting vanilla bean. I do not. Toasted almond. Yes. Cinnamon. Yes. Butterscotch. No. It doesn't have that kind of sweetness. Um, let's give it another one. I'm just, I, th I think I'm just taken aback by how young it is. And I guess I should have known better. It's, it can't be a straight bourbon until it's aged for four years. Um, no, that's not right. It, it cannot go without an age statement until it's been aged for four years. Straight bourbon can be two years. Um, got my, got my, my, my terms mixified. <laughs> All right. All right. Kevin's talking. Silky butterscotch. No, I'm not getting that. I'm not getting the silkiness. I mean, okay. Once you get past the ethanol and the youth of the pour, yes, it is unfiltered. So it does have a buttery, silky mouthfeel that I really like. I love unfiltered bourbons. They make me very happy. This one is just young to me. Um, and I still don't have any great tasting notes for you. Um, that The youth of this pour is just overwhelming me. One more, and then I'll put water on it. Toasted almond, yes. Cinnamon, yes. Uh, pepper, yes. Some vanilla. Um, some of the normal notes, but it is, I think, a higher rye. Um, I'm getting some grassiness. Um, you might kind of equate this with like a Bibb and Tucker. Um, it's got a almost a grassy note to it, which, again, uh, could be indicative of the high rye. Um, it doesn't have a huge barley content. I mean, I've seen barley go all the way from 15% to like, Five percent. This is right there in the middle at ten percent. Um, so, being that it's kind of like a mid-level barley content, that could be giving me a little bit of those uh, those grassy notes as well. Um, Kevin, I don't know if you're getting the grassy notes off of this, but I am. Um, and to me, I, I I just think it needs more time in the barrel for me. All right, so let's test that. Sometimes when you add water and it opens it up. Um, it can equate to what it would be like if I left it open on the shelf for a month, two months. I gave that a good squirt. That was probably a good half ounce. 
Uh, no, nah, maybe a quarter ounce. All right. I'm getting a numbness right here. And I shouldn't be getting that with 100 proof. You know, I should not be getting any numbness anywhere in my mouth for 100 proof. Evan Williams has that 100 proof, right? That bottled and bond. And to me, that's a little bit of a harsher pour than other Evan Williams products. Um, but I really like that one, and it doesn't make anything numb. <laughs> num, 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 num. <laughs> So, all right, put a little water on it. Get it shorshed around. Mm-hmm. That did it. That took care of the problem. I'm going to let that sucker sit for a couple of weeks after this. Because that brought out those butterscotches. Um, it took down... It improved the mouthfeel, and I already liked the mouthfeel. Took down that proof, took out that, that youthfulness of it, gave it some character. Ooh, it needed to open up. That was good. That was good. Uh, vanilla's there. Definitely uh, honey. Uh, I'm, I, that time I, I got uh, more of the vanilla and some of that butterscotch. I'm going to see what else I get out of it. Honey and butterscotch. Water brings the oak out for you, Kevin. That's fair. That's fair. I'm still getting, um, I, I, instead of almonds now, it's more of a sweeter nut, like a hazelnut. Um, I've gotten to the point where I have more difficulty, I guess, noticing the oak in these pores. Because... All of them are going to have some essence of oak. There are some that are more oaky than others and present themselves as such to me a little bit more presently. Uh, Woodford Reserve is one of those. Um, the Larceny, even though it's weeded, to me that seems more oaky and more smoky than other pores. Not the barrel proof, just the regular 92. Um, so I guess my palate has become... A little bit desensitized when it comes to the oakiness of a pour. But if you point it out to me like that, Kevin, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree with you. Um, um, but the water, to me, is what really brought out the flavors of this. Again, mine is a fresh crack. Kevin, I don't know how long yours was open, but mine is a fresh crack, and it needs to sit. It needs to sit there and think about what it's done <laughs> for a little while. <laughs> I'm going to put it in the corner. Over nya. And that's where it's going to sit for probably a good month before I ever touch it again. All right. So um, one more of these and a little bit of a um, little bit of ice. All right. I don't want to blow my wad here because I've got the rye to do, and I'm going to make a Long Island iced tea. Today is National Tea Day, and I. Wanted to celebrate that. Oh my. Froze to it. Here's one of my gorgeous ice spheres. <laughs> I should have probably done this upstairs where I had more table room. Uh, I've got all, <laughs> all these little stools and now I've got this stand and <laughs> I'm a silly boy. <laughs> all right. Okay, that's plenty. And then we're going to move on to the rye. And I wasn't going to do the rye tonight. I was going to wait till next week. I was going to split them up. But I thought, you know, there's so much information about Pinhook that I wanted to get through. I don't want to go through all that twice. <laughs> so we're just going to do it the one time and go through both of them. While this is cooling off, I'm going to get that rye opened. Again, this is another one of those companies that like, to, nah, that actually came off pretty easily, that likes to do this wax crap. I don't like this. I don't like it. it. It's kitschy. I get it. But it starts to age a little bit, and then it gets all crumbly, and then you end up with a mess. I'm going to go ahead and just pop that cork. There we go. So last week, Jeff and his wife came over, and we did the Angel's Envies, the uh, single barrels. 
I will be honest and tell you that when they left, <laughs> I got back into that bottle of Larceny Barrel Proof. It's not often that I wake up the next day in bad shape. <laughs> it really is not often. I can hold my liquor pretty well. Last Thursday was the last time I drank until tonight. <laughs> What's that tell you? That was a little much. All right. Maybe that's why the 100 proof got me, because I hadn't had anything in a while. Okay. This ought to be cooled down. Cooled down enough with my gorgeous ice spear. <laughs> Something about it changed over ice. It seems... The only way I can describe it is it seems dirty. The mouthfeel changed. Um, the flavors of it changed. And not for the better. I don't think I would recommend this one on ice. I won't do that again. It didn't fall apart. There's still flavor there, and it, it's not, it's not horrible. Just the best expression of this particular bottle today, fresh crack is on water. Ice didn't do anything for it whatsoever. Nope. So I will not tell you that I'm a fan of Pinhook bourbon, um, which isn't the first time that's happened. Um, you know, it wasn't that long ago we did the chicken cock, and the chicken cock bourbon was okay. The rye was where it's at. So, let's get into the rye. Maybe I'll be surprised. Now, the rye, I don't know if this is still MGP or if Castle and Key does this too. I did not find anything specific. Well, you know, it might even say on the back. Let me look. Because it says on the back of that one. Distilled at Castle and Key. Okay. Now I know. So this is not MGP either. We'll see if that's to their detriment or a plus for them. All right. So the rye, 20% corn, 60% rye. 60% would represent a kind of a lower mid-rye content. Uh, ryes, by their very nature, have got to be at least 51% rye. And that's where you're getting the low rye. That's where you're getting the Sazerac. It's a rye. It's 51% rye, but it's 51. It doesn't go any higher than that. 51% rye on the Sazerac. It's also the same for the Rittenhouse, the Pikesville, and the Elijah Craig rye, all from Heaven Hill. So, this, uh, the other ones, like I did the Redemption, those were like up around the 95 level. And then, of course, the Alberta rye was 100% rye. So that's a high rye rye. <laughs> this is a mid-level rye, maybe a lower mid-level rye. Uh, it's got a lot of corn content. 20%, uh, then 60% uh, rye, and then 20% malted barley. <laughs> okay, so Kevin... Um, Kevin is well known to be in opposition, to my opinion, of mellow corn. I found mellow corn to be drinkable. I liked it. I didn't love it. I liked it. Um, I would drink mellow corn if somebody offered it to me. I wouldn't turn it down. Uh, Kevin, on the other hand, has a different opinion of mellow corn. Uh, gave me the rest of his bottle. Couldn't stand another drop. Um, what his comment here is, on ice, tastes as good as mellow corn for me. <laughs> so, so it's not just me then, Kevin. That's good. I was not good on ice. I did not enjoy it. It was not refreshing. It was not tasty. It, it was just was, I mean, it just isn't. It, just, it might be okay in a cocktail, but why? I mean, it, unless you want to get rid of it. I'm not going to say that it's that bad. I've had much, much worse. There are bourbons that I've had that I just 
do not like and will never buy again. I won't tell you that I will never buy Pinhook again. I will tell you that I'm going to set this on the shelf for a couple of weeks or a month, and then I'll change my mind and see what, and maybe I'll change my mind, maybe I won't. Maybe it'll still be young and gross. It's not gross. <laughs> I'm being mouthy. I don't mean to be mouthy. All right, let's try this rye. <laughs> All right. You said also that you picked your bottle up today with the Jefferson Ocean Rye. So yours is a fresh crack too, okay. You're getting a different expression out of it than I am. I did see the uh, Jefferson Ocean's Rye on the shelf. I decided not to buy it. Um, I haven't, I have, a, I have one ocean and I haven't made a big deal out of opening that yet. I, I'm not sure I'm really on board with the hype, if you'll pardon the pun, on board. <laughs> Ship ocean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, I, it seems like an expensive gimmick, and I, you know, I just, just make me some bourbon. Gimmicks aside, I, you know, I'm done with the gimmicks. Just make bourbon and quit screwing around with dumb stuff. Like somebody was saying that how, they, how, how excited they were to try Oak and Eden bourbon uh, and Spire or whatever it was and and i will tell you and i told him i said you're not gonna like it and if you do like it okay but i don't like it <laughs> i don't like it it's it, if it's set like i think mine's set three months it became somewhat drinkable but then by that point the the spire inside of the oak and eden had started to fall apart it had started to like biodegrade or something and i was getting pieces of that spire on my tongue Ugh. i wanted to run through a coffee filter or at least a strainer. Get that crap out of it. But I did finish the bottle, and I will never, ever, ever buy Oak and Eden ever again. So this one I could buy again. I just know how to drink it. We'll see what it's like after it sits. Let's get to the rye. Almost drank it without smelling it. <laughs> Ooh, okay. That's got some really nice spice to it. Gosh, what is that? Oh, I wish I could identify that. Okay, on the nose they say um, clove, walnut, honeycomb. Okay. All right. Yeah, I can see that. It's got that just slight earthiness of walnut, uh, that slight sweetness, but not over the top sweetness of a honeycomb. You know, you got the honey. That's really good, the honeycomb. Okay. I'll learn more about the differences when I take my executive bourbon steward class. That'll be this summer sometime. Yeah, I know. It's got a... I'm smelling red hot. You know, um, not the, Louis, Lu, the Louisiana cooking sauce, but like a red hot candy, like a cinnamon candy. Black cherry. This is a little pepper. I like this nose. This might be like the chicken cock. I might like the rye better. That happens occasionally. All right, I need a palate cleanser. The two together didn't work very well. All right. Okay. Just needed to clean that palate off. Let's try it one more time. Very earthy. Um, I think I like it neat better than the bourbon. Um, but it's very unique. It's got very unique characteristics. I don't know that I've ever had a rye that tastes like this. And I, I'm having difficulty pinpointing anything to describe it as similar to... Um, and I'm having trouble pulling out specific notes. Again, it's saying baked apple, black pepper, and toffee for the notes on the palate. 
Let me see if I can get one of those. This is really unusual. Maybe if I stretch it, the toffee. Maybe. Um, no, missed that one. Um, okay. It's not going to seem very flattering. And I don't mean this in a disparaging way. And maybe it's because I had this first and I just need to ruminate <laughs> in the rye a little bit. But what comes to, out on my palate is cardboard. Now, when you're talking about a pizza, that is a sla that's slander, right? Tastes like the cardboard it came on. I'm not going to say that about this. I'm not being slanderous. I'm not being negative. You know, when we say that a, that, a, that a whiskey can have tobacco notes, that may turn some people off. When we say it might have leather notes, that's going to turn people off. When people say it, it tastes like it's earthy and tastes like twigs and bushes, that's going to turn people off. Because they don't understand what that means in the expression of a bourbon. So when I say that it tastes like cardboard... That's the image that it's conjuring for me. And it's just a unique expression that seems to be hitting my palate in a way that is unusual. <laughs> that being said, do I like it better than bourbon? I said a minute ago I like it better than bourbon. I don't know if I do. I don't know if I do. Mm-hmm. Okay, there's a brightness to it. There's a wine-like quality to the very front of the tongue and a little bit around the sides. Um, when I taste this, the back is not flattering. The back is like cardboard. The front has got a wine-like uh, um, palate to it. Um, there's just a, a, a brightness, a fruitiness. It's, it's fleeting. It doesn't last very long, but it's there on the front. Um, this is a very unusual pour. There is a tobacco note to it, as a matter of fact. <laughs> yeah, I'm not getting the same notes they are, but let's uh, move on. All right. I should have probably split these up like I was going to and done this on a separate night outside of the bourbon because I don't I don't think that I'm being fair to this rye. I like ryes. And I because I tasted them back to back, I don't I don't know that I'm being fair. But let's give it another shot. Let me uh let me cleanse the palate one more time. You may be asking, why does he drink out of a Gatorade bottle? An old one at that. If you've ever carried around a disposable water bottle, you know that they're very loud. I can squish this and there's no sound, right? Other, other than the water in it. That's the first thing. So I will take these when I go hunting uh, because if I drink out of it, you're not going to have a lot of noise and it'll scare the animals away. I also do this when I'm hiking because I don't want to scare the animals away. It also has an orange top, so if I drop it, I'll be able to find it. Huh? White top? No. Orange top? Yes. So that's why I like these bottles. I just refill them over and over and over again. These are old, but I run them through, I run them through the dishwasher just to make sure that they are good and clean and not going to hurt me. Um, nah, I don't know, once a month or so. So that's why the Gatorade bottle. I love those things, the sports bottles. The newer ones are like shaped weird. They're like skinny up here and big up here. 
I don't like them. <laughs> Just a little something more that you didn't need to know. <laughs> okay. All right, so I've added a little bit of water to this. Let's see what it does, shall we? Almost nothing. Um, there's some caramel that came out, which was really nice, actually. Um, the one thing I'll say about the rye for sure is it doesn't taste and feel as young as the bourbon. And the rye is also unfiltered. I had to look. I forgot to look earlier. The rye is unfiltered as well. So the mouth feels good. Um, Maybe it has something to do with that middle level rye, 60% uh, of the rye. I don't know. I can't tell you that I will, like, recommend either one of these bottles. None of them has really done it for me. Um, you know, the Rossford Union I could talk about because that was delish. Uh, that's a rye. Uh, there's other ones that I can talk about that are delish. Uh, last week we had the Angel's Envy Single Barrel. Um, the one that Jeff brought uh, had coffee notes, brown sugar notes, and it was, I think, delicious and unusual. And, you know, other people that are bourbon purists and want that cinnamon and toffee and, and vanilla and blah, blah, they would have hated it. But I liked the different expression to it. It was cloudy as hell, and it had sentiment in the bottom, uh, sediment in the bottom. But it was, it, I, I liked the different expression of it. I thought it was great. I liked it better than my own, which is more traditional. Um, these two, I don't know. I think they're going to sit on the shelf for a while, and I'll revisit them later. Uh, okay, so we've, oh, I didn't do this over ice yet. I'm just going to use the same ice. I know you're not supposed to do that. But I don't think I like either one of these enough to completely waste a nice sphere on it. Uh, I don't dislike them. I like them enough that I will drink them again. The bourbon seems young. The rye, it's not bowling me over. I was excited about these, and I, I'm disappointed that they're not uh, wowing me like I wanted them to. All right. Okay. All right. So on ice, let's see. The rye, the bourbon did not do well on ice. Let's see how the rye does. The rye does better on ice. There's a lot of flavor there. Um, a lot of typical rye flavors, the baking spices, the honeys, um, not so much the butter. That's one of, those, one of the flavor profiles I really like out of a rye, and it's not here. Um, but yeah, I like this one on ice. It's still not, it, it's still not tops, but it's, it's better. It's good. Uh, it's, it's fine, right? That's what the girlfriend says, right? When she's mad at you and she doesn't want to be mad at you. It's fine when it isn't. <laughs> yeah. Or the wife. <laughs> or the, what was his name? Char Charles Nelson Riley. <laughs> Those of you that are younger, you won't know what that is. Look him up. He had a signature harumph. <laughs> Very funny guy. Huge on the Hollywood squares. Okay. Uh, next. This is National Tea Day. And I promised myself that I would... Well, Okay, so I promised, I, I told myself I was going to do, and I told you I was going to do a Long Island iced tea. And then I started to think about reneging on that promise. No, <laughs> I had it right the first time. And doing instead a tea-based simple syrup for like an old-fashioned. Well, then I got talking to somebody last night, and they were saying how much they enjoyed Long Island iced teas. I thought, all right. 
I guess I will make a Long Island iced tea. So I had to go to the store today because I don't keep very much rum in the house, which is a shame because I, I like rum. So we'll start off. You got the five clears, right? So we're going to do a half ounce of rum. This is just Bacardi. This is great for any Long Island. It doesn't have to be anything special, just a white, clear rum, and Bacardi is a great choice. All right, so we'll do that. Then I picked up for the tea or for the gin day, gin and tonic day, I picked up Tangare. So I'm going to use that. This is a half ounce that I'm putting in. Half ounce rum, half ounce gin, and I chose Wheatley Vodka. You can use any vodka you want. Um, my favorite is Stoli's, but I do like the Wheatley a lot. A little higher proof, lots of nice flavors. I do like it. So we're going to use a half ounce of the Wheatley Vodka. And then, uh, to kill you. <laughs> I was watching YouTube videos the other day about how tequila is made. Really enjoyed that, by the way. I know all this stuff about bourbon. I'm a bourbon steward, but I'm not a tequila steward. I don't know if that's a thing, but I'd like to be one. Okay, so tequila. This is the uh, Casamigos tequila. This is supposed to be among the tops of tequila. It's not a Don Julio. It's not a Patron. There's definitely some... It's not that they cut out the, the, the bottoms and the tops. It's definitely got a tequila flavor to it. It's not as smooth as Patron or Don Julio, but it's decent, uh, decent tequila. And then I've got uh, Triple Sec. There are, there are so many different types of Triple Sec. This is a Paramount. It's low end. Um, I, I've got a couple other ones. Like this is a Arrow Triple Sec. Uh, it's a little bit better. And then I've got another one yet that's a 99 proof that's Juarez. But I don't have those open. This one's open. I'm going to use it. Even though it's an orange liqueur, it's considered a clear liqueur. So we're going to go ahead and do, yeah, half ounce of this one as well. There we go. And I've got the ice in there. And then, the last ingredient that you would normally put in the shaker is something called Lemex which is a sugary, chemically mishmash of garbage that they have put together that is supposed to taste lemony. No. I'm not drinking that. If you like the Lemex, what you could do is mix in a half ounce of lemon and a half ounce of simple syrup if you wanted to. Me being somebody who likes to avoid sugar, I'm going to go strictly with the lemon. As a matter of fact, I talked to somebody today who is originally from Long Island, and they told me to take a half a lemon, squeeze that bad boy right in there, and that's all you need to do. Okay? Why did I put that in my ice bucket? <laughs> who cares? <laughs> Now, the last ingredient is cola, and I left that in the fridge. I'll get that in a second. But one of the recipes that I saw said that you put the cola in the shaker. Cola is carbonated. You don't want to add that to a shaker. What happens when you shake up a cola? Uh, uh. Right? Don't add the cola to your shaker. Kevin, it's talking to me. Mix together over ice. Mix what together over ice? I must have missed something. All right, so let's do this. Now, I have been wanting to use this glass. I bought Tom Collins glasses a while ago. And I haven't been able to use them until now. i got to get all my spheres out of the way. I've got to get rid of my fears. My spheres. <laughs> All right. So 
right, let's add some ice to this bad boy. Really? <laughs> All right. I'm trying to do it the right way and use my thingy thing. Uh, maybe a couple more. Oh my gosh, all my ice cubes are frozen together. That, that'll do. All right. Okay. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got to get the cola. Now, the general recipe for a Long Island iced tea is to use the standard cola, uh, but I have this one. <laughs> I have Diet Pepsi. The nice thing about Diet Pepsi is it has a sweetness to it that the other one doesn't have, and it can bridge that gap if you didn't use the Lemex that sugary, icky mix, instead of actual fresh lemon juice. So that's essentially the Long Island iced tea. This happens to be one of my favorite drinks. And you fill the rest up with the cola, just let it cascade around, look at that, isn't that gorgeous? Mix the rye and the bourbon together. Huh. Okay. Okay. I will do that. I'll do that before I try this. Because I know that's going to be good. <laughs> you can't screw that up. All right. I'm going to do a half ounce of each. This is the rye. This is the bourbon. Bourbon. Ooh, my fingers smell like lemon. <laughs> right. Did you get the rye, Kevin? Is this an experiment that you have started and I'm following through on? Alright. Oh, by the way, for that Long Island, it's not a bad idea to do a little garnish. Now I'm really gonna have a uh, lemon fingers. Wanna smell? <laughs> Alright. Let's play stink finger. <laughs> I cracked myself up. I have to. All right, so we're mixing these together. No, I just bought the bourbon. Okay, so this is an experiment that's only for me. Thank you, Kevin. I get to be the guinea pig on this. Mixing the rye and the bourbon together. Then after this, I'm going to let them sit. And I will report back. And we've already gone longer than I intended to go. I'm sorry. By golly, now you got something that's drinkable. Oh my gosh. Wow. Some really nice citrus notes coming out. The vanilla's there, the honey's there, the toffee's there. Kevin, nice job, dude. That was a great suggestion. These are really nice together. I would buy them again just to do this. Wow. <laughs> they really complement each other nicely. It takes care of the, the youth of the bourbon. It gives it a really nice mouthfeel. Buttery. Not that I'm tasting butter, but it's a nice buttery. It's got a nice viscosity to the mouthfeel. The two together are both unfiltered. You put them together. Oh, my Lord. That's nice. <laughs> oh. So if you're going to go buy one of these, buy them both. Do what I did. Try them each. See what you think of them. Maybe try them on different nights. 
and then on the third night, put them together. <laughs> I really like that, actually. Uh, I love it. Kevin, that was a great suggestion. All right, Long Island iced tea. Like, I need more. This is one of the most potent drinks that you can make. It's got five different liquors in it. And if you use the Juarez, that's an almost 100 proof just in the, the, uh, the triple sec. This is a very kicking drink. It's also one of my favorites, and it's delicious. Mmm. Yeah. That's really good. Thank you. Again, for coming along and um, being here with me on my silly hijinks and, and trying these different things, um, I do appreciate it uh, more than you know. I really, really enjoy doing this. And the fact that you're willing to come and watch me do it and uh, offer commentary and so on along the way, I love it. I love the interactivity. Um, the YouTube stuff is starting to get viewed. I, I hit a milestone on YouTube. Um, I think 50 hours of views or something like that. So, um so go there and check it out, YouTube, Beautiful Bourbon. Um, we're propagating everything on the website as well, beautifulbourbon.com. Um, I need to pick up the Instagram a little bit, need to pick up the blog a little bit. Um, excuse me, but we're getting there. All right, so next week, I've been pressured to do this one. I've had it in my possession for about, I don't know, a month, five weeks. Six weeks, we are going to be doing the Buzzard's Roost Rye next week. This is one I've heard nothing but good about. I'm getting crowded here. Let's move some stuff out of the way. All right. So the Buzzard's Roost is new in the area, new to Ohio. Um, people are raving about it. I will put it to the test next Thursday. Before I think of, uh, before I forget about it, I need to check and see, I, Kevin, I'm getting there. <laughs> What's next week? I'm getting, here it is. Uh, so let me make sure there are no holidays between now and then. The 23rd, nope. Something else on the day, nope. There are no holidays between now and next Thursday that are on the bourbon holiday list. So I will see you next Thursday and I'll be doing the Buzzard's Roost Rye. Um, this is still available everywhere. I've been seeing it on the shelves. You should have no trouble finding it. So if you do, head to Finley uh, because I know it's on the shelves at the beverage barn. Um, elsewhere, do your recon. Take a look. Find out because this is the one we're doing and you should drink along with me. Buzzard's Roost. Um, the little bit of information about this. This is 114.3 proof. <laughs> Buzzard's Roost Straight Rye Whiskey. Barrel strength. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we will just do this next week. We will not do a mixed drink or anything else. That. That's all. Buzzards Roost Rye. All right, next week. Thank you again for joining us. I, I do appreciate you coming here, and we will see you again next Thursday. Drink responsibly, get a DD, and uh, all the preaching aside, thank you.